Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Datum Basics, Plain Speaking. My name is Kelly Schwartzley, Marketing Manager for ECM, and I'll be your moderator for today. This is the second webinar in our educational webinar series. If you are a returning attendee, welcome back. If this is your first time attending one of our webinars, thanks for trying us out today. Our webinars will all revolve around educating you, the user of metrology instruments and helping you to advance your metrology skill set. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today, and that is why we are keeping this webinar to a short 30 minutes of presentation and 10 minutes of Q&A. We will be keeping everyone muted throughout the presentation to minimize background noises. Please feel free to ask any questions you may have by using the questions box on your control panel. We will be answering in as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the webinar. And now, I would like to introduce today's presenter, our Principal Engineer and Lead Training Instructor for ECM, Tom Kinnear. Thanks, Callie. Hi, everybody, and welcome to uh, our second in this webinar series, uh, Data Basics, Plain Speaking. Um, I apologize for the title. It's my idea of a joke. Uh, before we actually get into the, into the real meat of the webinar, uh, a little bit about East Coast Metrology. Uh, we're a provider of 3D metrology services, um, you know, 3D scanning and modeling, CMM programming, inspection, uh, education, training, and certification, uh, automation and systems integration, building information modeling, you know, industrial field measurement. Uh, that's probably our bread and butter. Equipment calibration, rentals and repairs. We do a lot of that work too. Uh, mostly arms, trackers, uh, some scanners, and some theodolites. And we do as-built scanning and reverse engineering. Uh, you know, we're highlighting training courses with this webinar series. We'll do it at our facility or at yours. And uh, there's a list of courses that we offer there. We're also happy to try to build custom courses for somebody with particular requirements. For more information, you can visit our website. Uh, you can contact us at the office or by email. And uh, with that, let's get into the real part of the subject here. By the end of our webinar today, hopefully you'll be able to understand the traditional three-plane datum reference frame, be able to distinguish whether datums are subject to size or not, uh, be able to describe a pass-fail test for primary datum planes. Understand that there may be more than one candidate datum frame. Uh, and list factors that affect the selection of a datum reference frame. Uh, why datum planes? Why, why that subject for our second webinar? You know, datum planes are really important. They're commonly used to define datum reference frames. Uh, and, you know, we use those frames to define how we report results for most GD&T tolerance characteristics. Um, also, I, I can't really in good, conscious, good conscience uh, do a webinar on something like true position or, or other, other subjects that people asked for after our first webinar, you know, without talking about datums first. Uh, so that's partly why we're here. And... A lot of times when people are talking about datum planes and datums, uh, they're looking at it from the point of view of Y14.5, and they usually explain it pretty well, but there is some additional information in Y14.5.1 that gets omitted, swept under the carpet, and today I kind of hope to drag some of that out in the second half of the presentation. I use two primary references putting this webinar together. ASME Y14.5, uh, the 2009 edition is the current GD&T standard in the U.S. ASME Y14.5.1, Mathematical Definition of Dimensioning and Tolerancing Principles. And I'd really like to add, if anyone has a good reference on the subject, uh, definitely bring it up at q and I'm always looking for new references to, to check out and try to deepen my understanding, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you are too. So uh, I have here a sample drawing, 
and I want to check this this pattern of counterboard holes. Right? One, two, three counterboard holes. My A datum, they're uh, called out true position with respect to ABC. My A datum is on this side, or the bottom of the block, I guess. B datum would be this long side, and the C datum would be this the shorter side of the L. Uh, actually, before I go much further, you know, with modern machining techniques, uh, usually parts are pretty darn good. And so a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about is kind of on the edge. Uh, but if you do a lot of work with, with castings, particularly big sand castings, all of this stuff uh, is an everyday occurrence. Um, yeah. So suppose we were going to check this part with calipers. Uh, if the datum surfaces are imperfect, you know, how would we measure? Now the uh, part might have a long, a long bow along one edge. Um, you know, do you try to measure from you know, kind of the minimum distance to the hole? Do you try to measure the maximum distance to the hole at the corners? Uh, if an edge is cut at a slope, this edge is supposed to be perpendicular to datum B, but if it was cut at, cut at an angle, uh, if you try to go in there with calipers, you're probably going to end up measuring a distance perpendicular to that angled face. That might not be what you want. Um, you know, uh, here's a close-up view showing just what I was talking about. You know, are we going to measure perpendicular to the space? Measure from a high or a low point, or maybe just the closest point of approach to that to that feature that we want to know. You know, this 3.75 dimension of. And the problem extends into three dimensions. You know, the sides of the block could uh, could be bowed out, like here on the left. It could have some funny funny shaping come in. And are you going to try to measure again closest point, farthest point, point at the top, point at the bottom? Uh, there's there's some uncertainty there. Hopefully, establishing a good datum reference frame uh, can help clarify some of that confusion. Uh, datum reference frame, it's basically a coordinate system for measuring and reporting. It's defined by three mutually perpendicular planes. And that's true even if you're working with a cylindrical coordinate system, uh, say with a turned part. Officially, the datum reference frame consists of three mutually perpendicular frames. The usual spiel. You know, what people usually talk about when they're talking about datums. Uh, part's got six degrees of freedom. And you need to constrain those degrees of freedom in order to get the part lined up for measurement. You've got three translational degrees, translation in X, Y, or Z along the major axes. You've got three rotations, uh, angular rotations around X, Y, or Z, you know, surrounded by these little circles around my axes. Right. Just running real quick through a sample callout. Uh, I've got this part with these features called out to this datum scheme. We've already talked about the datum scheme a little bit. Right, so to establish the primary datum, you know, I would put the part on on some sort of, uh, we match, match that bottom of the part, the A datum surface shown here, to our primary datum plane. Uh, if we're doing it with a tabletop, that'd be like a, probably a surface plate or something. Uh, you know, doing that is going to eliminate two rotational degrees of freedom and one translational degree of freedom, right? Because if, if that A data plane is stuck to stuck to uh, our primary data plane, then we won't be able to move up and down without lifting that bottom uh, planar feature off off the datum, and we won't be able to rotate without lifting some portion of it off the datum or pushing some portion of it into the data. Uh, for our example, uh, translation in X and translation in Y and rotation around the Z axis are still unconstrained, uh, kind of shown by the th three different other parts I've got in this picture. And our secondary and tertiary datums will constrain the remaining degrees of freedom. The secondary datum plane um, will eliminate two more degrees of freedom in this three plane system. And in our example, we take our, our datum block, we push it against our secondary plane, and that's going to eliminate uh, rotation around the z-axis and translation in y. Uh, maybe important to 
to note that depending on how good the datum feature is, the actual the actual surface on the part is the datum feature. It, you know, you may have just a few points of contact, or you may have the whole face contact that that data plane. And uh, finally, you've got your tertiary your tertiary datum plane. Uh, in in our example, that's TX. Uh, you know, by taking the blocks, sliding along the primary and secondary planes until uh, some point on that tertiary datum feature touches off the datum plane. Uh, that's how we constrain that last degree of freedom. No longer let it move in X. The part's now fully constrained and ready to measure to the whole pattern. Right? And a lot of times when someone's giving you the usual spiel, you'll get some bonus information. Um, they may talk about the num minimum number of contact points for each of the datum planes, primary plane having a minimum of three data points, a secondary plane having two, a tertiary plane having one. Uh, you may even get a discussion of three to one datum schemes, you know, perhaps as applied to castings, where the datums are actually established by specific points at different locations on the casting, rather than having a plane. So for simulating datums with tabletop equipment, uh, the 14.5 um, by 1 has a lovely phrase uh, when it talks about the equipment that we that we would use to simulate datums. It talks about surfaces of such quality that they are essentially perfect. I, I like really like that phrase for some reason. Um, but again, just running through it, we place the block on our surface plate to simulate the primary datum. Push it against this um, one two three block to simulate the second, and then slide it down touch off on our second one, two, three block to simulate the tertiary data. Right? And that would help help us clarify what to do with the calipers, right? And the one, two, three blocks and the and the surface plate simulate our datums. And we can measure with the blade of the calipers against the one, two, three blocks. So we can measure um, distance from from this datum simulate this datum, datum simulating surface, you know, to the center of the hole. We can measure off off the other one too, and our measurements will be clear and unambiguous. When we use CMMs, we do things a little bit differently. Um, we measure points on the planes or features. We then construct features from the point, usually with a best fit algorithm. Sometimes our measurement software will, will be enable us to use some sort of contact fit. Um, and then after we construct those features, we construct a frame, a, a reference system, a coordinate system from those features. And that coordinate system will be oriented to the measured features. It's almost like we're bringing the datum frame to the part. Right? And quickly just summarizing, measure the points, build planar features from those points, and then define a coordinate system based on those planes. Uh, you know, I find it interesting why 14.5.1, the mathematical definition, also describes datum reference frames in terms of bringing the frame to the part. They talk about bringing the primary plane to the primary datum plane to the datum feature plane on, on the part. Uh, just interesting. Now, this is that was that was the usual spiel. That's going to be adequate for 99.9999% of metrology work. Um, and what follows after this is me kind of going down the rabbit hole, uh, digging into 14.5.1. It may never actually be useful to you uh, in your career. On the other hand, uh, knowledge is always good. And someday, if you know this, it may let you pass a part that would otherwise require rework. But there will be you know, no marks deducted from your grade if you cut class now. Um, another thing I just want to mention real quick is when we get around to the Q&A and comment time, uh, if you can indicate how, how useful going down the rabbit hole is, uh, that would be good. And uh, my next webinar or some follow-on webinar, I can 
try to do it again or never do it again based on your feedback. Okay, looking behind the curtain. Excuse me, just a second. Okay, why 14.5.1? Oh, it says a couple different things that I think are important. It talk, first talks about two different types of datums. Um, it sets up a procedure for datum plane acceptability, and I should really say surface datum plane acceptability. Uh, it gives you some rules for building candidate datum reference frames, and they're called candidate frames because you may actually end up constructing a number of them, and you know you'll you'll choose the one that you actually end up using. So they're they're there, they're available. Um, we also talk about candidate datum plans before we know, because it may be possible to have more than one, more than one datum plane that plane that would be acceptable on a given surface. Uh, we talk about those as candidate datum plans also, uh, until we know which one we're using. And then, um, you know, there's there's a rule for selecting which datum reference frame that you would that you would use after you construct from the ones you've constructed. The two types of datum. There's datums that are not subject to size variation, and these would be surface planes. Um, you know, the datum is just kind of how that surface fits against an idealized plane. And then there's datums that are subject to size variation, spheres, cylinders, and widths. Widths are actually um, features in the part like a slot or some kind of boss. And you know, if, if that slot or boss is used as a datum, you're actually going to be working with a derived median plane, not actually the part surfaces. Um, just like the cylinders and the spheres, you know, the center line and the center point are kind of constructs that we, that we generate from the measurements, but they're not actually representative of the surface itself. So surface planes are kind of special. Um, and something to notice, even though widths do create a, a data plane, they use a different procedure than the one discussed below. All right. So what happens when you have imperfect data planes? Sometimes a planar surface just isn't, just isn't planar. You've got machining marks. You've got possible defects if it's a molded part, uh, defects in the mold surface that were transferred to the part. Right? And so your surface comes out when you view it on a very small scale comes out all rough and jagged, who knows what. You know, and these kind of imperfections often result in a lot of uh, high points you know, scattered across the surface. Um, you know, I've got a picture here of my part and all these little colored dots represent some measurement that I took. Uh, red ones indicate high points, maybe with respect to a, a uh, best fit plane through, the, through that face, um, you know. The, the orange or yellow are points that would be relatively close, and then blue are the low points. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not consistent in that color application through the through the discussion, so you'll have to stay sharp. Um, sometimes the problem is more global. You've got concave, convex, or twisted surfaces, or some surface that has a combination of those defects. Um, and there may actually be multiple orientations where different points would contact a theoretical data. You know, a, a convex part may only have a, a line of contact in the middle. Um, and then you could you could rock that part around that line. All right, and then the, if you rock the part, the line of contact would actually move. A uh, concave part, you know, may touch up just on the corners. Uh, that may that may be relatively easy to deal with. Um, but a twisted part will have maybe a line of contact along one edge and then a point of contact on the other end. Um, but if I was to press down on, on this far corner that, that currently is up off my simulated data plane and push that down, then I'd have contact all along that edge and I'd have a single point of contact down here. So, um, you know, having, you know, the option for multiple planes or the possibility of multiple planes. Uh, it's a real thing that could happen. Okay, 
Now, when you do have imperfect data plans, and again, let me just say, you know, most of the time, parts made with modern methods, you're not going to need to go here. You're going to you're going to be able to find a data plane that's good, solid enough, um, dependable enough to use. But if for some reason you don't, Y1451 has a procedure to uh, establish an acceptable imperfect data. The procedure is roughly pick a proposed data plane, um, which just means you get to choose. Uh, common sense will usually drive your choice. Then you're going to locate contact points between the actual surface and that, uh, that theoretical plane. You, you, um, you project the contact points onto a number of lines that are in that theoretical plane and then you examine the distribution of points if they pass. You get to keep the plane as a possible uh, candidate data plane. If they don't pass, then you totally discard that plane. It just won't work. It's not, it's not good enough. You'll have to find a better plane. And you repeat the process with a new plane until you're satisfied that you've got all of them or a representative group or enough to do the job you need it to do. Okay. Planes are always tested in order of precedence. We're going to do primary planes first, uh, and then we'll do secondaries, then we'll do tertiaries. So, you know, we start with the primary datum and propose a plane that makes a set of support. Uh, it's a phrase that Y14.5.1 uses, uh, and it just means a plane that, that touches but doesn't cut through the part. I've got a couple examples down here of sets of support. You know, I could have a plane that touches off down on this surface at this high point, or um, one that touches off the high point but doesn't quite touch anything else. Uh, that could be a set of support if I've already got other constraints on the part. Or this, this one that touches off on just two points, and by the time it gets down to the front of the part, it's quite far away. Those are all sets of support. Uh, some examples of ones that aren't is, uh, say, this, this perspective plane that touches off two high points but would cut through this even higher point. And it's worth mentioning that a least square fit plane is not a set of support. It's an average plane typically runs through the middle of middle of our surface. We'll have low points, we'll have high points. Um, again, with modern technology, usually the part's good enough that there's not much difference between a least squares fit plane and a plane that would be a set of support, but there's a potential difference. And I have run into it. Um, yeah, but I won't go into that story. Now, uh, proposing a perspective plane. Now, we've taken our CMM, we've measured the part. You know, normally, then, we would, if we're going to propose a perspective plane, we would just look at the high points and try to get an idea of you know, what to do with those, um, get, get an idea from those what a reasonable perspective plane would be, right? Um, typically, by defining planes through those high spots. Um, the important part is to check that the planes really are only tangent and don't end up intersecting the part in some way, and that's the actual part. Um, you know, yeah. All right. So here I've identified my parts. I've identified a candidate plane, a perspective plane, right, and it contacts down here. We're just going to step through the procedure using this using this example plane and these example high points. Um, next, you're going to make a line on that perspective plane and it's going to cover depending on how, if you, whenever you view the part from a, an angle perpendicular to that line, so I'm looking in from this side, right, the line is going to be as long as the part looks, right, so here I'm looking in this way come off the edges of my line, it's that long. If I pick a line down here, it'll come off this edge and this edge, right, and it would be that long. And this line across the diagonal would look like the full length of the diagonal. Um, 
you know, we're going to divide that line into thirds. So it's got three parts. The outer, outer thirds of the line are called region one and region two. Uh, they're, they're symmetric. You could go region one and region two if you wanted. Uh, the spec requires you to repeat this for all lines in the plane. So you basically have to take, uh, say, for this is my first line, I have to go through a set of lines that rotated 180 degrees. Uh, parallel, parallel lines will always give you the same result. So you don't have to go full 360. And now the test. I take my measured, measured contact points and I'm going to project them to these lines in the planes. The test is if all of, if all of these projected points fall into either region 1 or all of the projected points fall into region 2 of a given line, then the plane's not acceptable. So looking at our example here, say this line, I've got, I've got, you know, these points come down, they project into region one, this point projects into region, into the middle region, this point projects into region two, you know, that looks great. Taking them off onto this line, um, you know, these points project into region, we'll call it region two, I guess. I've got two points over here that project into the middle region. You know, so far this, this plane is looking great. I take one last one last line down this side, and all these points project into, you know, call this one region one. Right? This plane would fail. Right? And it kind of makes sense physically. You, you don't really want a datum set up on a little tiny fraction of a surface in general. Um, you know, if you fail, try again. Pick a new candidate plane. I pick a new candidate plane, you know. Look for contact, and you know if I got contact here and here and here. I do my projections. This line looks great. I got projected points in all three zones, all three regions. You know these two points project into say region one, but this one projects into the middle region, so that's great. And looking at it, this line, all three project into the three different regions, so that lines would pass, and this, this plane would pass. Uh, quick note though, that one third value for the different regions, for regions one and region two, uh, that's the Y1451 default. But it can be modified by the part designer with an appropriate note or standard. Just one more example of why I say you should always read all the notes on the drawing before you try to measure anything. Okay, so you could end up with multiple planes that pass the test. Say you had a plane that passed, but for some reason you just didn't like it, you might, you know, try a second or third candidate datum plane and see if those pass, and they might. Um, you know, so any path, any any plane that you propose that passes the test is a candidate primary datum plane. Right now, for each candidate primary datum plane, you must search for secondary datum planes. Okay. The search for secondary datum planes is uh, a little different. Oh man, I'm running out of time. I'm going to have to hurry. All right. Uh, and the test changes depending on what the primary was. If the primary was a sphere, you're going to use that same procedure I just went through exactly. If it was an axis perpendicular to secondary, uh, then the secondary plane is going to be basically oriented perpendicular to that axis, and you're going to pick the plane that forms a set of support with the part, right? just like pushing the part. Against, against the plane. Uh, if it's anything else, and if you're using a three data plane, it is something else, you're going to modify the primary data procedure. You're going to use the primary data procedure but modify it. Now, if your test plane is, your test planes, planes that you can propose are limited to planes that are perpendicular to the primary data. And your test line, you only have one test line, it's perpendicular to the direction of primary data, is how they explain it in. Uh, in the spec, but I like to think of it as the line being parallel to that candidate primary data plane. Right. We go through the same same rigmarole. You know, propose our plane, look at our points, uh, 
and then check the line and check where the projecting points fall on the line and make sure they don't fall all in region one or region two, but you know they're in, occupy at least two regions. Tertiary data plane, again, the test changes depending on what degrees of freedom are made. You've got a rotational degree of freedom, or if you have a rotational degree of freedom left, then you're going to use uh, the primary data procedure. Um, and right, and that would that would happen if that won't happen with uh, a three-plane system. It'll happen if you've got uh, you know an uh, axis symmetric part, a turned part, and your primary primaries and secondaries were down the side. Um, you know, the spec says if you have a degree of freedom that is not rotational, uh, I believe just translation, this is what we're going to have in a three-plane system. Uh, you're looking for a plane basically oriented that is perpendicular to the primary and secondary datums, and that'll form a set of supports of the part, right? Uh, which would be option three from the previous slide, uh, or no, I'm sorry, option two from the previous slide for our three-plane system. Uh, and this works just like the tertiary data procedure from the usual spiel. The part's locked into the primary and second datum, secondary, and we slide the part until it stops on the tertiary. Or alternatively, we bring the tertiary plane to the part. Okay, uh, flying through it. Now we can take all the possible candidate datums and we build candidate datum reference frames. You start with a primary, you can only use secondaries associated with that primary. So if I had more than one primary, um, I couldn't grab, couldn't grab a secondary that I built from that other primary to use with my first primary. And then you can only use tertiaries that are associated with a primary and secondary. And you repeat as needed to get a combination of data. So you can end up with more than one frame. Right. Uh, I've got this matrix here which shows you know, primary datum one, some secondary datums that come off of that. Tertiaries that come off this. One nice thing about the three-plane system is you'll only ever have one tertiary associated with a given primary-secondary combination. Over here, I've got my second primary, some secondaries that come off that. I've got this red line indicating that thou shalt not cross. Right? Can't bring a secondary from over here, under here, to try to build a frame. Right? And then I build my frames from these in, in columns. Uh, now, so I, in this case, I would have five frames. How do I choose which one to use? This is the best news of today. You choose the one that passes features. Okay? Uh, there are limits. The principal limit is the simultaneity requirement. All features that use the same datum callouts must use the same datum reference frame. I can't cherry pick and use one of those one of those candidate frames for some features that call them out and use a different candidate frame for other features that call them out. But any changes to the datum scheme, like material condition, order of precedence, or datum callouts, uh, gives you a clean slate, and you can use different candidates then, right? right? So here I just have a couple of examples. You know, say we started with, with features called out to this callout, uh, whole pattern. I've got a second whole pattern. Uh, this one's called out to maximum material condition on the feature, right? And it would use the same datum reference. Um, our, our datum reference frame doesn't care if we had maximum material called out on the feature. Um, because we're using because we're using surface datum planes for our three datums, we could not put a material condition on any of the, any of those. But if we had some other scheme. Um, and then we had a maximum material in there, then we could use different ABC. Just note that to the side. But for the three-plane system, we can't put material conditions on the datums and you know get a get a reboot that way. Um, this this whole pattern you know calls out the datums in a different order, right? It's obviously a different frame, and you could use it one of your different candidate frame different candidate datum planes for A. Right, different primary candidate data plane. Um, this callout uses a different, you know, there's there's a whole different uh, data referenced here. 
And again, this would be a different frame. And you could possibly use a different A and B, different primary and secondary, when I build my can you know, when I choose a candidate frame for this set of datums, right? Um, this last one uh, is called out to A, B, and E, just like the one above. Right, so this perpendicularity column would have to use exactly the same frame as, as this whole pattern above it. Um, you know, you don't get a you don't get a reboot just because you changed what type of type of tolerance you're looking for. Totally dependent on datums. All right, that's the end of uh, the webinar. Uh, question and answer period will follow. I thank you for staying with me and listening, and I look forward to any questions and any feedback uh, so I can improve future webinars. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we'll open it up now uh, for any of your questions coming through. We do have a couple. I invite you to use your control panel uh, to go ahead and type any more questions you have. I'll go ahead and start, Tom, with uh, the first couple that have come in. Uh, the first one is, how would you select a perspective datum plane to test? Oh, okay. Uh, that's a great question. Um, hang on a second. Let's go back. Uh, let's come back to... Uh, Come back to this slide. All right. Um, all right. So I wrote I wrote this like the spec talks about where it says yeah propose a plane find your contact points and and then uh, do this test. What I would probably do is I'd probably look at my measured points. Uh, you know, using a CMM. So I've got a, you know a set of measured points. I'd look at the deviations. I'd probably try to find the three highest points. First thing I would do is check and see if they were well distributed over my surface. Hopefully, I've got you know plenty of plenty of space between them all, um, so that when I do when I test the plane, it's going to pass. And and then I would build a plane through those three high points. Um, I might I might even then go back and do a div plot of my measured points to that that plane and make sure that they all fall you know, on the low side of that plane to make sure that plane is high and doesn't actually cut through the part. So I do have a set of support. And that's that's probably how I would I would approach it. Look for points with high deviations that are that are you know high positive deviations indicating high spots on the point of the on the part and build a plane just through three points. Okay. Next question. Thanks Tom. Uh, next question is this procedure for finding candidate datum planes and choosing the right one seems like a lot of work. <laughs> Why would I ever want to do it? <laughs> uh, it it is a lot of work, uh, and it's you know it's uh, it's not really complicated, but it is a lot of a lot of kind of drudgery involved. Um, and odds are you'll never have to do this, uh, as I kind of tried to stress through. Throughout the uh, the webinar, but you might find yourself in a jam. You got a you got a part that's close to passing. Uh, you may you, and it you know rework would be you know expensive, uh, take too long. You're behind schedule. I don't know. You know, you, you probably have some other driver, you know, saying you know pass this part if I can, and this. You know, it gives you gives you a framework, a procedure to try to maybe define a new coordinate system, which is perfectly acceptable, which will let you pass that part. Uh, otherwise, you know, yeah, it's a lot of extra work. Um, why would you go here? Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, let's see. Uh, one more question uh, just came in. Once you select a starting plane and find that the data was not to your liking, can you back up and pick another? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, it's just important. You pick another, test that. You know, test test that uh, test that plane. Make sure it's an acceptable plane, and you're perfectly perfectly uh, permitted to to go ahead with that. Okay. 
Uh, a couple of comments, but, but really no more questions. Uh, so we really appreciate your feedback. And I want to thank you, Tom, because um, that is uh, the questions that we're going to answer today. If you have any other questions, you can email training at eastcoastmetrology.com. We can answer any of your questions offline as well. Any questions that come in after this, feel free. Uh, to go ahead and email us, or you can still uh, put them on the questions panel before we exit the webinar. I want to thank everyone again for joining us today. I hope you are leaving this webinar with some useful information. Remember that we've only just scratched the surface on this topic during today's webinar, and I do invite you to check out our website, eastcoastmetrology.com, for the opportunity to take one of our two- to three-day training classes at our facility or yours. We are always taking comments as to what you want to learn for our next webinar. We are new at these webinars, and we want to make sure that you're getting something out of them. So please take a minute to fill out our survey upon your exit of our webinar, and we would be happy to take your feedback. Thanks again. We hope you join us on May 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern for our next webinar, True Position, GD&T Basics, Referencing Datum. Thank you all.